Um, thank you very much uh, for coming back promptly. Uh, we now have a, uh, a bold experiment in uh, two sessions with two speakers each. Um, and the, we, we try and make these sessions kind of a coherent topic. So we did sort of publishing in libraries and so on. Uh, here we sort of have a coherent pair of topics, really, of open access and open science, but particularly with a focus on how that works within organizations. So again, I'm not going to do uh, great introductions because you can read the bios in the brochure. I'm really just going to hand over to, uh, I think, Elizabeth, who's going to speak first, and then we're just going to work through the program for this session. Thank you. So, good afternoon. I'm Lizzie Gadd, and this is my colleague Yvonne Budden. Um, I'm from the Loughborough University, and Yvonne is from the University of Warwick. And this session examines the administrative challenges of uh, implementing open access policy within universities. So, I'm old enough to have been around at the birth of open access, uh, and lucky enough to been, have been involved in one of the earliest projects, a JISC funded project uh, in this space, um, the Romeo Project back in 2003. So, I well remember the hope that this concept of open access brought us. At last, institutions would be able to take control over their own intellectual property. All people everywhere could have access to the latest scholarly advances. And perhaps if there were alternative uh, open access copies of papers available, the cost of journal subscriptions might reduce, and that money could be fed back into science. The possibilities were endless. Unfortunately, 15 years on, those dreams have not been realized in the way that we envisaged. We are seeing an increase in the volume of open access in various forms. So the recent UUK report um, informed us that about a third of UK authored papers are available on immediate open access in some form. But this small advance has come at a considerable financial and administrative cost to those working in universities to make it happen. So this session, uh, hopes to unpack some of those challenges in both a quantitative and a qualitative way. So firstly, I'll report on some high-level uh, analysis as to how publisher open access policies have changed in the last 12 years. And then Yvonne will take over and provide a case study as to exactly how not only publisher, but also funder open access policies have impacted on her work at the University of Warwick as they seek to manage both green and gold open access. Before we launch in, we have to confess that we are under considerable pressure to make this presentation a thing of beauty. When Mark contacted us to say that our proposal had been accepted, he warned us that in the past we have had very negative reactions to towards two-person presentations from our delegates, as they frequently are uncoordinated, contradictory, self-indulgent, confusing, duplicative and run over time. So we are determined to buck this trend, uh, but I should like to apologise in advance for any poor coordination, contradiction, self-indulgence, confusion, duplication and shoddy time management. So on to business. So uh, this study I'm going to report on, it used... Um, we were trying to understand publishers changing open access policies over a considerable period of time, so I worked with uh, Denise Trollcovi at Carnegie Mellon University to plot the changing open access policies of the original 107 publishers on the Romeo database at its inception in 2004 over a 12-year period, as indexed by the Internet Archive, also known as the Wayback Machine. As Romeo's metadata is not structured, we had to manually analyze the data, and the aim was to understand the volume and type of restrictions around what, where, when, and how self-archiving was permitted by the publisher, and also whether they had a paid open access option. As you probably know, the Romeo database color codes publishers as to whether they allow immediately the self-archiving of the preprint, in which case they're yellow, the postprint, in which case they're blue, both, in which case they're green, or none, in which case they're white. Um, and you can see from this chart that the volume of publishers qualifying for a Romeo color code, that's the top uh, dark um, dotted line there, rose over the 12-year period. And when added to those, the lower dotted line there, uh, which are those who allow some form of self-archiving even though they're white, so usually under an embargo period, the proportion of publishers allowing self-archiving um, according to the Romeo colour coding system had risen to 91% over the 12-year period at the end of 2015, this was. So on the face of it, this is really good news. Publishers are increasingly allowing 
green open access. Unfortunately, despite the growth in publishers allowing some form of self-archiving over time, the volume of restrictions around self-archiving also increased, as did the volume of gold uh, open access policies. So this chart provides an overview of the rise in restrictions as to when the author can self-archive their work, that's the red bars, i.e. embargo periods, but not exclusively, where an author can self-archive, those are the blue bars, so on a personal web page or a repository, and how an author can self-archive, so those are the longest green bars there, so all the different publisher requirements, acknowledging the publisher using a set phrase and so on. And the purple line over the top there shows the background increase in the volume of publishers with a paid open access option, which suggests a relationship between the two. And of course, whilst these instructions are aimed at authors in the UK because of the Hefke open access policy, it's mainly librarians such as Yvonne and her team that end up interpreting these policies and implementing them. So what do they have to deal with? Well, the first challenge is around the growth in the volume and the range of embargo periods, but more specifically, the growth of linked embargo periods, that's the black line over the top there, where embargo periods will vary according to who funded the research or where an item is deposited. So in 2015, half of all linked embargoes were the result of funder mandates, such as the NIH and the Wellcome Trust. And you can see that after a fairly even split between 12, six and 12 month embargoes in 2005, 2006, 7, by 2015, 62% of embargoes were for 12 months in line with major funder mandates. And as an aside, we have to ask ourselves here, if funders had not waded in with mandates and permittable embargo periods, um, what would this data look like? I mean, funders are um, credited with leveraging open access uh, through their mandates, but have they just made the landscape a whole lot more complicated and in some case legitimised embargo periods from publishers that otherwise they might not have implemented? The second challenge faced by universities is publisher restrictions around institutional repositories deposit. So publishers can get a Romeo colour code simply by allowing the immediate deposit uh, of a paper on the author's personal web page. And you can see from the data here that the most commonly allowed deposit location and the one showing the greatest growth there at the top um, was the personal web page. And often in the data you could see that a publisher moved from Romeo white to having a Romeo colour uh, simply by allowing authors to self-archive on their own web pages. In fact, about 10% of publishers over the time frame each year earned their colour in this way, and a further 25% um, earned theirs by allowing self-archiving on either a personal web page or an institutional web page, but not a repository. Indeed, by 2015, two-thirds of the occurrences of the term institutional repository in the Romeo metadata uh, were linked to some form of restriction around deposit in a repository. This is clearly a problem for institutions running institutional repositories, and not just because it stops them from uploading, um, but because authors will see that a publisher is Romeo Green, think they can publish with them and meet either their funder or institutional open access requirements, and later learn that they can't because the publisher's green colour has been earned through allowing deposit on a personal web page only. And the final set of challenges um, around green open access for universities is the volume and variety of additional restrictions that publishers place on self-archiving that I group together under this term how restrictions. I think it's here that we see a lot of the nitty-gritty uh, admin challenges in dealing with publisher policies. In fact, in the 2014 research consulting study into the cost of open access, uh, it found that many participants questioned whether libraries' current role in rigorously policing individual deposits to ensure compliance with publisher policies was sustainable as the volume increased. So you can see here on the chart that acknowledging the publisher and linking to the publisher version are the most common requirements, fairly straightforward. However, by 2015, one third of publishers asked that the acknowledgement was made using a set phrase. And this is significant because repository managers can't then create generic cover sheets and standardize that task. 
Other requirements were less prevalent, but still create additional work for library open access teams because they don't apply to all papers. These include a requirement for a fee to be paid if an author wants to avoid an embargo period or use the publisher PDF, a requirement to remove the preprint once the postprint was made available in a repository, and a requirement to notify the publisher of the location of the pre or postprint. Of course, this study just looked at publisher level policies, but for about 10% of publishers, their policies varied according to journal. So creating even more work for open access teams who can't then rely on their publisher level knowledge. This practice also causes additional confusion for academics as to which policy applies. And I once heard of a case of, um, where a paper seemed to be subject to three different open access policies, the publishers, the journals, and the learned societies. Another issue here is that you'll often find um, that a publisher's blurb on their web page describing their open access policy differs and can be in conflict with the formal agreement that's actually signed by the author, leading me to advise authors more than once to take screenshots of both, because web pages can change, so they've got a, a record of what they've actually signed up to. The final thing to mention here is the number of publishers specifying certain reuse licenses for self-archived work. By 2015, only 10 publishers specified their preferred reuse license in the Romeo metadata anyway. But without guidance, universities are left guessing and may end up making papers available under reuse licenses uh, that the publisher is unhappy with. Where they did specify, not surprisingly, a range of different licenses and terms were used, again making it impossible for repository teams to standardise this. So now, to give us a case study uh, around the real-life impacts of all this kind of high-level data, I'm going to provide a seamless, coordinated and not at all self-indulgent handover <laughs> to Yvonne. I did warn Lizzie if she was wanting somebody with good time management, I was possibly not the person to be giving the case study this afternoon. <laughs> but certainly to kind of, uh, to build on the work that Lizzie's um, been mentioning, um, we felt that it would be really useful to kind of take it back to a much more micro level and actually look at kind of the day-to-day -day work um, of our team um, here in the, uh, at the institution of the University of Warwick. I'm the Head of Scholarly Communications now at the University of Warwick. I've been there, um, I've been working at the University of Warwick for very nearly a decade. I've been involved in open access um, for just as long um, and very, and it first got involved in um, open access at my previous institution at the University of Birmingham um, and uh, have for the last five and a half years stood as the chair for the UK Council of Research Repositories. So I've had a bit of experience um, in managing these various kind of policy stack challenges um, and so forth. A little background to the Warwick um, context uh, just before we launch into the open access side of things. We're a plate glass, which was a new term to me, um, or established in the 1960s, research intensive Russell Group institution of a medium size. We cover most subject areas across the board and have a number of uh, centres of doctoral training which cover all of our faculties. Some of these are externally funded, so have uh, requirements on them around from their funders, and some are internally funded. We also have an Institute of Advanced Studies, which is a, um, a, it's a key way for us to develop our PGR students as they move into um, an academic career. In terms of our, um, where we get our research funding from, um, this is in the main um, about 40% um, from research councils and UK government. Uh, we then, uh, then under that, it's uh, around the industry and uh, European Union funding. The least funding we get um, is from charities. So when I'm discussing our work around the Charities Open Access Fund, um, this is one of the smaller areas that we're working in, in there. Um, but it is worth noting that we have our uh, industrial funding or our commercial funding is focused on particular um, particular departments more than others um, so we have some areas where industry funding is a really key part, part um, and some areas where industry funding is something that that doesn't factor um, into their thinking 
In terms of um, open access, we've uh, had our institutional repository now running uh, again for a decade. Uh, we currently have over 80,000 records within the uh, repository. And if you look at the repository as a whole, um, we're currently logging about 25% full text uh, within our institutional repository. Over that decade, we've logged around 9.7 million downloads of the various um, items and cont content within the repository. In contrast, in the last year, we added um, 5,500 items uh, in a single year. 68% of that um, had been deposited with full text. So previously, where we were balancing workloads that were coming in between full text and the, um, the additional work around that, processing those items in terms of creating cover sheets um, and building material around there, we were balancing that out with, with record-only um, submissions. Now, almost 70% of our uh, deposits are full text um, items. We do have um, an, a fairly considerable RCUK block grant, just under £500,000 um, in the year. We do also operate a University of Warwick open access policy, but this is probably the last time you will hear me mention that um, through this session. The, in, the institution's open access policy was designed to support the RCUK policy um, in, in its in, inception, um, but has since um, effectively been taken over um, by the Hefke deposit um, uh, open access policy. Um, it's strongly green um, in nature. So while there are funding, we do get funding from RCUK as well as from COAF for our open access. Um, and the library has been able to create a small open access fund of their own. Um, this is the, uh, uh, the majority of our research is still made available through green um, open access. So in the support we offer, we look at both sides um, of the coin. Uh, we support both open access through the gold route um, as well as through the green route, and we promote each, side, each um, um, option equally. Um, and as you can see here, we've created a very nice slide where, we've bought, where open access is described very simply, very straightforwardly, nice little diagram um, there. Um, however, the reality is not always that simple um, and uh, this is possibly one of my favorite blog titles um, ever um, it really is complicated um, and we've heard mentioned a number a numerous times so far today how complicated researchers are finding kind of managing this process um, researchers continue to be overwhelmed with the complexity of the interlocking policies they're being asked um, and frustrated by the number of different actions they need to take to comply our work has always been as much as possible to give them a simple, single answer. Do this and you're compliant. Um, but we've also sought to understand the processes um, from their perspective. As part of this, we've run a number of surveys um, with our researchers about their attitudes um, to open access. We ran the first one in 2011 um, as part of a national survey that was then coordinated by the Repository Support Project and UK Core. Um, and again, it's looking particularly about the attitudes to open access generally, their practices around open access processes and how they're engaging with mandates. We ran the survey again in 2014 and are currently running it for a third time. I'd hoped to have um, the results of the third process um, for, for today, but at the moment I'm just giving you some initial eye views from across the three surveys. One thing we have seen is that researchers in surveys are reporting that their support for open access principles are declining slightly across the, um, across the surveys. Um, and, but the number of people who have actually engaged and made their work open access is rapidly increasing. Over 70%, and this is static across all three surveys, have agreed that authors should own their own copyright. 93% um, declared that they keep a copy of their um, author accepted manuscript, um, but I'll say a little bit more about that in a moment, um, mainly around the fact um, as whether, we, whether the researchers actually uh, recognize that as such and whether what they mean by the author accepted manuscript is quite what we mean. Um, 
Support for Creative Commons license for Creative Commons licenses remains uh, static um, as well, but it's also um, only around 60, it's 50 to 60 percent um, across the surveys, um, and that's particularly support for the CC BY license, the Creative Commons Attribution license, which we first asked about in the 2014 survey um, around the uh, uh, the implementation of the RC UK policy. It's much, much lower in areas that have strong ties um, to industry, um, but also in those areas and departments where we see a high level of uh, high levels of use of third-party copyright. Here are a few of the um, free text comments we've uh, seen. Um, this again, I'm cherry picking from across the surveys, um, so these aren't necessarily um, this year as well. But the concerns remain um, pretty strong. Uh, the concern across the three surveys, particularly around pinpointing dates of acceptance, practice across this seems to vary by publisher, by discipline, um, by approach, um, and some forth. And kind of pinpointing that accepted version seems to be a real area of difficulty. The time needed and the difficulty of navigating the policies and processes is also a concern. There is a strong concern that's run through a number of the surveys as well around the cost of gold open access and that's in its effect on the available research funds um, for them to actually do the bit they're interested in. Quality of pure open access journals was much more of a concern um, in earlier surveys but again um, seems to have been um, something that's kind of normalising as we go through. Concerns about projects jointly funded by RCUK and commercial companies uh, is a key area of concern. Uh, again, in navigating that, this has particularly been exacerbated um, by the EPSRC um, uh, policy around data sharing um, and so forth. There has uh, been a lot of work we've needed to do to um, kind of to discuss these, the, the way those two policies interact and the ways that we can um, help them to comply with the EPSRC policy. Um, um, but not uh, and not actually make the commercial data um, available. Intellectual property rights and copyright um, are also areas of concern for researchers. As I say, 70% of them believe that the re that the um, copyright should stay with the um, with the authors. Um, though again, we've not seen as much movement as I'd like um, around researchers trying to keep their copyright rather than signing it over um, at the next point. There's usually only one question that our researchers ask us um, about open access at the moment, especially right now because we're in the middle of a mini ref exercise. Um, is it compliant? Have I done everything? It, you know, do I need to think about anything else? As Lizzie discussed earlier, to, to work this out just for an institutional repository deposit for a paper that for, a ref, for the REF funded by RCUK and COAF, um, we're looking at approximately, well, we're looking at 13 separate common pieces of information that we need to have recorded. We then combine those um, in a variety of different ways. These items of information are everything from item type, who's the funder, date of acceptance, is it gold or green, what are the licensing on the files, do we have the version of record or the uh, author accepted manuscript, who paid for the open access, um, uh, has it been deposited in um, PubMed Central and so forth. Adding in other funders adds in other layers of complexity and potentially even at that point, doesn't cover all of the uses that the researcher might actually want to engage with, um, such as posting to ResearchGate or to a subject repository. So looking at a few examples um, as we go through, um, here are a few examples of uh, some of these particular, um, uh, for particular um, items within the repository. Um, this one is one of the easiest. There was no funders associated with this. The institution um, funded the research um, within itself. It was published in a journal that had a zero month embargo and it's going to one of the science panels. And the, the researcher had deposited it um, within the three month window after the date of acceptance. This one's one of the ones I quite like getting because these are quite easy. Here we're adding in the complexity that we're looking at both HEFKE um, and RCUK, and again you can see the increased number of um, items of uh, information we needed to pull out. 
Also, because uh, this is a green deposit, but the gold option was available, it meets the requirements even with a 24-month embargo. Again, all of these things are the sort of things that we, we don't necessarily want to ask our researchers to care about, um, particularly. But actually finding a quick and easy way where we can say yes compliant, no compliant um, becomes very difficult. Um, and finally, the most complex one um, that I could find just when looking at the last kind of week or so of deposits um, was one that has funding from the Cancer Research UK, the Medical Research Council, Welcome, as well as others. Um, but those were the three funders we were interested in looking at compliance for. Um, and again, yes, it is compliant, but there's a whole collection more information that we've needed um, to gather. And this one has been um, helped by the fact that it's actually published in an open access journal um, in the first place. One thing that none of these examples have covered is the behind the scenes processes um, as, as well. Um, these are the processes that we've had to manage within the library, such as pulling in the, pulling in the deposit, adding the um, uh, cover sheets, uh, managing the communications with the researcher, um, managing the uh, invoicing, the splitting payments between funds, um, and reporting compliance uh, to funders. I said I'd say a little bit more about accepted versions. They continue to be a diffi difficult for researchers to identify. One of the questions that was asked of the panel um, previous to this session was around the, um, uh, the kind of what was the one thing that we might ask of publishers. Um, if you could find some way to make sure your researchers know that this is actually the accepted version, that would be brilliant. Um, because we continue to have issues with um, f publishers using, uh, asking researchers to use templates, providing proof versions, um, but also getting it at the right time for the researchers to be compliant with the, the REF policy um, is also an area of concern. I put this together because somebody asked me what was our process um, for uh, funding a gold open access paper. Um, and this is the ideal process. The author requests it, we say yes or no, we create the cost code, get the invoice, pay it. Sounds simple. Um, quite often our processes look a little bit like this um, in reality. Um, they're not just our processes, um, though there are some um, niggles. I am getting more and more respect for my finance, co finance office colleagues every day um, in how they uh, manage to handle volumes of invoices coming in um, and payments. It's a mixture of publisher processes um, that add in additional um, complexity as well. There doesn't seem to be um, two publishers that have a set, the same way to request an invoice um, together. So again, um, and also we have a range of publishers that we uh, have deals and offset, offsetting agreements with, where that, again, it's a completely different process to actually access um, the funding. One thing we're always conscious of is how much is too much. Um, and this is too much in, in, in everything. Each researcher will have a different level for this, a different point on the scale where they'll want us to stop. You know, anybody who's ever spoken to a group of researchers, this is the point where you start seeing more than two or three people have got their eyes completely glazed over and you've completely lost them. You know, how much, info, how much is too much information for us to give them? How much is too much information for us to ask of them? At what point does the cost of this, both in time and financially, um, start being a point where the researcher is not willing to cross? Um, we have a group of researchers who will only ask for open access funding if it's below a certain figure because they refuse to um, uh, pay more um, again. And how much chasing um, do they want us to do? And how much chasing do they want, um, uh, want from us? Do they just want us to go away? Um, or do they actually want us to chase to the point where we, um, com we get every all the information we need? And it's balancing these things um, that's the area of concern. Um, as we've heard spoken as well, we're looking at supporting our, our researchers um, beyond compliance. Um, this is an area that's come much more to the forefront for me um, in the last few years um, because there's only so many times you can go into a room with a group of researchers and wave a big stick before you start um, talking to them, um, uh, you know, in, 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 in 
sorry, before you start talking to them around benefits um, and uh, support um, for wider uh, areas as well. Um, mainly because, uh, you know, open access is a really good thing. You know, I've been doing this for a decade. I really believe in open access. Um, but sometimes you only get 10 minutes in the room and the really key message is the message around compliance. So we are looking at supporting um, open access publishing by our researchers. Uh, we now have um, three journals being published through our, pu uh, our publishing hosting platform. We're also looking to promote the use of open access in wider senses. So using open access in teaching, ensuring that the re resources are listed in our catalogue. And we support uh, directly support open access initiatives such as Knowledge Unlatched um, and so forth. Um, and also, Open access, we found, is something that you can talk to researchers about straight and directly, but it's also useful to talk to them um, <coughs> sorry, around, the, around that fact as well. Um, so talking to, when you're talk, talking to them about open access, when you've got an opportunity to talk to them at, at any point. So wh what is going next? It, it's not all doom and gloom. Um, I know I've just spent the last... 15, 20 minutes saying that it is all doom and gloom. Um, I don't really believe that. Um, there are things, there are a number of things and initiatives that are helping. Work by publishers and intermediaries continues to improve the gold process, although maybe not as quickly as we'd like. Work with JISC on services around such as the publications router is getting our repository more of the record information um, that we need without it needing to be processed manually. Sherpa services continue to be much relied upon services, although after a while, as I'm sure many of the library staff in the room will tell you, you do start learning these policies by heart. Um, developments also, such as the UK Scholarly Communications Licence, have the potential to dramatically change how we do things. Um, but we'll still rely on researchers engaging with us, so the process of advocacy will continue. The reviews of the RC UK and CAF policy should create some challenges as they potentially cause us to change our messaging again. And the HEFKE policy expanding to books, um, again, is also likely to create challenges, particularly with groups of researchers, as we've heard mentioned this morning, um, also are under ever-increasing um, pressure um, to challenge the disciplines, still struggling to find their place um, in open access. Over the past decade, we've seen an enormous change in the open access environment. Not long after I started at Warwick, I was able to expand my team from 1.5 FTE to 3.5 FTE, and I was starting to really worry that I'd have things for them to do. Um, that's just not the case anymore. I personally continue to be optimistic about what the next decade will hold in the area and just where we might be in 2028. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. My name is uh, Paul Ayres. I'm Pro Vice Provost uh, in UCL, University College London, and I and my colleague, uh, Dr. Tiberius Ignat, who's Managing Director from Scientific Knowledge Services, are going to talk a little bit about um, open science and the impact that open science uh, has on uh, libraries. Uh, and these are the areas that we're going to talk about in this joint, uh, in this joint presentation. I'm going to say a little bit about the scope of open science, what it means, and then look uh, in a bit of detail in, into three areas. Open access as it's practiced in UCL. And I'm, I'm be pleased to um, hear your comments on the practice in UCL compared to the model we just heard for uh, uh, Warwick. Uh, some work in research data management and open uh, data leading to the European Open Science Cloud. Uh, and then uh, I'm going to hand over to my colleague, uh, Tiberius, who's going to talk about citizen science and the role of libraries and then bring the talk to some sort of conclusion. We talked earlier in the day about the cultural shift that's required to deliver open science in our institutions. And throughout this talk, I'd like you to hold in your mind three areas which we think are important, which underpin many of the developments we'll be talking about this afternoon. The first major shift, how scientists collaborate to create knowledge, and we'll be looking at some of the implications of this in developments like research data management and EOSC, the European Open Science Cloud. 
The second major shift we'd like to highlight, how scientists find meaning in knowledge, and the example we'd give here is the International HapMap project, which is looking at uh, charting the human genome in order to find variants and so find cures for diseases and uh, illnesses in, uh, in human beings. Uh, and the third cultural change that we'd like to highlight is the change in the relationship between science and society that open science brings. And again, Tiberius will talk more about this in the section on uh, citizen science. This is the definition of open science that I've taken. It's the definition from the Foster uh, project funded by the European Union, uh, which underpins the uh, talk that I'll be giving for the rest of the afternoon. Open science is the movement to make scientific research, data, and dissemination accessible at all levels of an inquiring society. That's the working definition of open science that we'll be following. And what I've done here is to try and map uh, those elements of, citizen, uh, of uh, open science that we'll be talking about in this presentation against the research cycle. So on the left-hand side, in uh, yellow or, or green, depending on your screen, you'll see a, an idealized version of the uh, research cycle from conceptualizing the idea down to publication of the final outputs of your uh, uh, research. And on the right-hand side, I've linked various aspects of the open science debate, and I've highlighted in red the ones that we'll be talking about uh, today. Citizen science, uh, open access, open data, and data-intensive approaches to uh, research. So let's start with the first of these, open access. And here I've linked, I've tried to illustrate the level of gold um, article processing charges that uh, UCL has uh, invested in and paid for since we started recording this information in uh, 2013. These payments are made by the library. So the library, uh, with my team of open access uh, officers, is responsible for making all these payments from various funding streams. And the three funding streams that I've I highlighted here are the RC UK, Research Councils UK, uh, COA funding, so Welcome and Associated Charity funding, and then a, a, a stream of funding from UCL itself to pay for researchers to publish in gold open access where they're not funded by an external funder. And you'll see through the various lines here that the various colors in the graph indicate different uh, um, uh, research funding uh, sources. And since we started counting in uh, 2013, we paid over 10,000 APCs. So it's been a major change to the work of the library in trying to absorb APC payment into our structures. Something we have done, which most universities don't yet have in the UK and on the continent of Europe, is an open access press. So UCL Press is the UK's first fully open access university press. Uh, when I constructed these slides in uh, December uh, last year, we had published 56 uh, monographs, and we're pu currently publishing uh, eight uh, journals. They've had over three quarters of a million downloads since the press started in 2015, and we're, we're aiming for, uh, well, we're projecting one million downloads from all our content by the summer, so we're planning our one millionth download party for May or June this year. The single uh, most uh, uh, downloaded book is by Danny Miller, who's uh, from our anthropology uh, department in UCL, and he's the recipient of a European Research Council grant looking at the impact of social media uh, on uh, society. And the most downloaded book is one of a series of 10 that he's publishing with us with money from the European Research Council, and this book is called How the World Changed Social Media. And he individually accounts for over 120,000 downloads in this total of 705,000. So our experience of open access research monograph publishing is that it transforms the way that the uh, output from arts and humanities researchers is read and used because it's downloaded in 221 countries across the world. There's practically no country in the world that doesn't uh, come into the logs as downloading UCL Press uh, material. 
So open access publishing based in the institution can transform the way that your research is being disseminated and used across the world. We also publish textbooks, and this is one of our first textbooks. It's written by Deepak Kanaska, and he's the man in the middle here. It's from our master's course at the Royal Free Hospital in Hampstead on burns and uh, reconstructive surgery. And this has been downloaded over 30,000 times. Downloaded probably by medical schools in developing countries who don't have access to funds to buy printed texts themselves. But because this is freely available over the web, it's being used in medical schools uh, across the globe. This is our publishing model. We have six staff in the press. Uh, they're not librarians, they're all um, publishers. Uh, and that's important because that was the model that I set up when I established the press. I didn't want librarians running publishing and they didn't want publishers working in the library. I set up the press as a separate press staffed by professional publishers, but run by the library. And what the library brings to the equation is our understanding of how the open access business model works in a publishing environment. So the press is a meeting of two uh, complementary workforces, publishers and libraries. Publishers bringing publishing knowledge and libraries bringing knowledge of an understanding of how open access works and developing open access business models to support the publishing activity. The second area that I want to talk about is research data management and look particularly at the output of another EU-funded project, the LEARN project, which my institution led. Uh, with, with, uh, there were five partners and it finished in uh, summer uh, last year. Uh, and the purpose of the project was to uh, try and illustrate how you embed a sound research data management practice in your institution for your researchers. And we produce a number of uh, deliverables, and they're listed here on the slide. A model research data management uh, policy. Uh, most institutions that we surveyed in the, in the two-year project didn't have research data management policies and didn't know how to construct them. So what our Viennese partner did, so the University of Vienna, constructed a model research data management policy by looking at existing policies across Europe and pulling out the main elements of those policies into one model template. This is the model template, the model research data management policy that we uh, uh, produced and is available as an open access output on the LEARN website for any institution to use. And institutions using this template are then able to compare their activity and their um, impact in research data management by looking at other policies from other institutions that are using the same template. So it allows benchmarking, which is more difficult to do if people aren't following uh, the same uh, uh, policy. Research data management at an institutional level is uh, important, but what happens when we want to talk about uh, research data management in the member states ac across national borders. How does work in research data management, maybe inspired by the learn, those learn outputs and deliverables, how does it all join up into one European view of what research data uh, can do? Well, in an open science environment, research data is the new currency. It's no longer the publication, which is the sole indication of the success of, of uh, research activity, you look not only at the publications, but also the open source code, uh, if the researchers have written open source outputs, but especially also the data, the building blocks on which the publications are, are, are based. So that has some interesting questions for REF in the UK, because REF in the UK is predicated entirely on publications and the impact those publications have. But in an open science environment, publications are just one output. So how is the REF going to cope with an open science landscape which looks at other outputs, particularly research data, as a, as a sign of impacts of research activity? One way in which the European Commission is tackling this issue of how to make research data one of the, uh, the new currency of uh, research activity is through uh, a development called the European Open Science Cloud. 
And this was uh, initiated by the report of an EU high-level expert group which reported in uh, 2016, and I was honoured to be a member of the high-level expert group. Uh, and we considered a number, of infra uh, a number of issues for how we would join up uh, research data management practice uh, across the member states, across uh, national borders. And the answer was to establish a European open science cloud where the outputs uh, that are available through the cloud, publications, open source uh, code, uh, and research data were open and fair findable, accessible, interoperable, and uh, reusable. And we looked at a number of issues on how the European uh, Open Science Cloud should be constructed. And here on the uh, slide at the bottom of the screen in these bullet points here, we, you, you can see the issues that we looked at, infrastructures, skills development, how to change reward and recognition frameworks in institutions so that openness is rewarded for promotion. And in my institution, in UCL, we have done this because we have changed the, the academic promotions criteria and the new policy came into force on the 1st of October last year. Uh, and openness is recognized as uh, a criterion for promotion and uh, for citation in, in the appraisal, uh, uh, ongoing appraisal and evaluation uh, process. So we talk about the San, the San Francisco Declaration on research assessment, and we say that we should not use journal impact factors as a surrogate for quality, because the important thing is the individual article, not a measurement that measures, if it measures anything, the quality of the, the impact of a journal. And we uh, encourage the uh, researchers to cite their open science practices in their case for uh, promotion. And this is all embedded in the um, UCL academic promotions framework, which, as I say, was um, promoted in uh, August last year. That's one of the building blocks to deliver the European Open Science Cloud because without reward systems in place, you won't, that these are, you won't have the carrots in order to encourage uh, researchers to change the way that they operate. These were the headline points from the high-level expert group uh, report. Um, I'm just going to talk about one or, or two of them, May, maybe the bottom two at the, at the end of the screen there. So it talked about the need to develop expertise in order to deliver the benefits that the cloud can uh, identify. And it made a couple of rather striking recommendations which the Commission want to take forward. That Europe needs half a million core data scientists in order to deliver the open science cloud. And there's an enormous challenge there for libraries, for IT staff, for academics. What is the skills base? What are the elements of knowledge that we need in order to be recognized as a data scientist? And how are we going to train them to be in place in uh, European institutions? And another very challenging um, metric for um, directors of research and people responsible for the finances uh, of the university, 5% of total research spend should be on data stewardship. That's what the report says. And if you look at that across Europe, that's a huge eye-watering amount of money that needs to be directed from research budgets to support uh, research data stewardship if we are going to deliver proper uh, research data management. So the European Open Science Cloud is a process, not a, not a project, not, not, a, not a single event. And what the Commission is doing is trying to advocate the benefits of the cloud and the construction of the cloud under these uh, three main headings. Uh, is advocating for fair data and a change in culture amongst researchers to value data alongside the publication. It's looking for services and architecture and infrastructure which will deliver the cloud. The, the, the findings of the initial report were that, um, uh, certainly to start with, we didn't need to build more infrastructure because Europe had enough infrastructure, enough platforms to house the research data. What was needed was to make those uh, platforms interoperable because they were too silo-based and they didn't talk to each other. So you couldn't extract metadata from the existing platforms and create the European Open Science Cloud, this overarching cloud that is the vision of the uh, Commission's funding activity. 
Uh, and the third point that the Commission is looking at is governance and, and funding, how all this is going to be funded. And they're looking at uh, really eye-watering sums of money, millions and millions of euros uh, to deliver the Open Science Cloud from um, Horizon 2020 funding and from the successor Framework 9 program and also from structural funds that come to the member states. And one of the big challenges uh, for Brexit for the UK once we leave uh, the Union is what is our relationship with the European Open Science Cloud? How can we participate in this pan-European project of European significance if we're not members of the Union that, are, that is funding it? The final part of my talk is on citizen science. I'm going to hand over to my colleague Tiberius Ignat, and he will talk about citizen science and then draw the talk to uh, conclusion. Thank you. Hello, everybody. <clears throat> so citizen science uh, is a building block of open science as we see it and as it is recommended by European Council. And we are looking to today for this building block as being part of academic life. Citizen science exists in some research organizations, non-academic, and we think it's a good idea to have it also in academic uh, institutions. What is citizen science? We think that science in general conveys our hope, dreams and ambitions and we think it should be a more open road between uh, science and society. There are several definitions associ associated with uh, citizen science. Um, we picked one from uh, European Council white paper on citizen science for Europe, which says that citizen science refers to general public engagement in scientific research activities when citizens actively contribute to science, either with their intellectual efforts or surrounding knowledge, or with their tools and resources. This is a, a, definition, a definition which we find it suitable for consideration also by academic uh, institutions. It is also interesting to, 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 to see what less under a definition uh, standard it said about citizen science, Professor Jan Chubb, Chub, the former chief scientist of Australia, describes or illustrates that science isn't just some, something scientists do. It is something in which every single one of us has a stake. We looked over the components of uh, citizen science. We tried to list them here as uh, ingredients for making citizen science. So there are a number of such components. And of course, the list is not complete, but we try to identify those which are most relevant for being considered by research organization and su re support research organization when looking for cooperating in citizen science projects. They are ranging from determining if it's suitable a project for citizen science principles, looking for producing protocols, data form, uh, su research support materials and um, uh, training programs, but also to more exotic maybe components of citizen science, which are regarding the recruitment process of citizen science, the re retention uh, uh, activities for having returning cit lay, uh, scientists, uh, citizen scientists. With a reference to, to the supply chain, which is subject of our conference today, um, we think that it, city, citizen science should encourage, you should be encouraged to equally look at these components also as important enablers of services that you would like to support for your organization. And each of these components should be looked as an opportunity for these services. Where to use citizen science? Although we all love uh, bugs and counting stars and other typical uh, science, uh, citizen science activities, there is more about citizen science and there are examples of citizen science projects, successful pr projects in a lot of areas. We listed just a few of them here. Um, we'll give an example of a, a project in digital humanities which is transcribed Bentham from uh, UCL 
but there are other projects which are extremely relevant, and they, they are not projects which happen today. They are, they, this is not only about future or about modern ways of um, uh, including citizens in research projects. Uh, William Hewell, which is a Queen Medal um, awarded scientist in the, from the 19th century, he mapped the coast where unpredictable tide, tidal cycles caused uh, shipwrecks and made coastal navigation very dangerous. And that time it wasn't possible to, to make it without citizen science. So he, he, covered, uh, he created and covered reports from six, uh, 650 tidal stations from nine na nations from both coasts of the At Atlantic involving 10,000 citizens. And that was a project in 19th century before, of course, internet and before telephone exists. And it would have not been possible without involving these uh, citizens. His um, uh, advances in tide, uh, tides research were not missing great minds or curious minds, were missing data to be collected by those um, which, which later on involved with his efforts. Another uh, example of citizen science, which is um, in practice, which exists now at UCL, is Transcribe Bentham. It's a, an award-winning participatory project based at the University of College, and its clear aim is to engage with public in the online trans transcription of original and unstudied manuscripts handwritten by Jeremy Bat Bentham. So while the scope exists in, in transcribing these uh, handwritten pieces, it, a clear aim of this project is to engage with um, citizen scientists. The project uh, is uh, hosted by Bentham Project at the Faculty of Law, and it is a project where uh, the um, library services of UCL is a, pr it's a partner in. So the library, it is a partner indeed in such pr uh, projects. This is one of, of the examples. Um, citizen science also offers great opportunities to, uh, to interactions with other members of our society. One example is the, in this project is the, uh, the Bentham Hackathon, where uh, UCL partnered with IBM. There are um, 10 areas of opportunities where we found roles for libraries. This is not, these are not representing, representing exclusive roles for libraries. There are also uh, roles for other members of um, other actors of this uh, supply um, chain from readers to researchers. And I invite you to look uh, as an, an area of, opportun of opportunity for your um, businesses and, and services. They are ranging from uh, developing skills and uh, supporting um, a toolkit for citizen science, developing collect collections of uh, protocols, of uh, checklists, of um, educational materials for citizen science projects, Make, uh, making the data which is coming from scientists, making it fair, offering the infrastructure, participating in evaluations, communicating and taking, the, taking into consideration the dissemination of both scholarly communications but also uh, pop science communications. And again, uh, some areas which look a bit, looks, uh, look a bit more exotic like recruitment, participating in marketing activities and the advocacy. What others says about, say about citizen science, European Union um, encouraged to promote the creation of appropriate tools as well as standards for citizen science. A European uh, League of Research Universities recognizes citizen science uh, as an evolving set of research methods and um, the contribution to, to research and recommends creating a single institutional point of contact for citizen science. Um, the European Association of Research Libraries wants to the, increase the role of libraries in um, supporting citizen science and is looking to, to organize a, uh, a workshop and to, uh, to explore how to encourage the, the library members to support citizen science activities. You are invited, we opened a, a survey for roles for libraries in citizen science. Um, we, we invited about 130 institutions, hand-picked institutions to contribute. We received um, 
uh, a rather small number of answers, I would say, and this speaks a bit about um, the perception about citizen science in uh, academic institutions. You are, you are all invited if you would like to, to contribute with your opinions on, on, on this. There are a number of challenges um, about um, open science and the transformation to open science of academic institutions. Uh, a conclusion of this talk is that libraries need to engage in a four-step test in order to measure their engagement in open science. And that would be how libraries are offering, offering leadership in their institution, what infrastructure is needed, technical stuff and resources, what new skills need to be acquired to del deliver open science, and how will they be acquired, and to ensure that your advocacy leads to innovation across your, your institution. This is a conclusion of our joint um, talk today. We are promoting uh, our views on uh, open science and uh, we try to, to, to move from, from a declaration mode to an implementation mode. We organized since um, 2015 a series of events on open science in partnership with UCL, sorry for my mistake, with UCL uh, Press and Liber organization. This year, um, this series of workshop will take us in Barcelona, Belgrade, Budapest, Dublin, Ljubljana, Rome, and Vienna. And the, the, mis the mission statement of, um, of our uh, series is to promote the concept of values and best practices of open science to U European communities. And we are happy to consider even more location. Um, you can read more about um, these views and uh, the conclusions of, um, of our interactions, interactions with different um, research-intensive research organizations in a paper which was published uh, this w last week, sorry, by the Gruiter. If you click, on, if you have access, you will have access to um, to these slides. If you click anywhere on this slide, you will you will go to to this um, article and we, we invite you to read, to comment and to send us your, your feedback. We are happy to, to answer any of your questions today. Thank you very much. Okay, that's great. I'd like to thank all four of you for your timely, consistent, um, coordinated, audience-friendly presentations, and thank you, Lizzie, for sharing that uh, confidential email. Um, I, don't, I can't remember quite what the copyright terms I put on the email were, but I'm pretty sure it wasn't CC BY. Anyway, um, we have, thanks to the excellent timekeeping of our speakers, we have five minutes uh, available just for some questions, so people are raving around with microphones, and if you want to raise your hand, we'll ask some questions. I can't see any hands raised at the moment. People are too stunned. Don't hold back. They've given you five minutes to ask questions. Anthony, you can start us off. Thank you so much. Just around the front here. Anthony Watkinson, uh, Cyber Research. I haven't really phrased this properly. Uh, all I was going to say really was to Elizabeth particularly and her colleague um, was that in the past, there, were, there was a, a system for publishers in the UK and JISC getting together. We produced a model license. We were going into these sort of questions. And then suddenly, JISC pulled the plug on the whole process, decided they didn't want anything to do with publishers anymore. Now, are you actually engaging with publishers? Am I personally engaging with publishers? Yeah. <laughs> no, is the short answer to that. But, but I, remember the, I remember the model license you um, talk of, and it did promise um, much to the UK HE community. Um, and it would be great if we did have a, a model license. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, somebody else, a question? Otherwise, I'm going to send you to your workshops early. Oh, there's uh, Toby just uh, uh, on the sideline there. Um, thank you. Um, uh, you mentioned at the beginning, you use an awful phrase, take back control, um, which, of course, brings to mind something else that is going on um, that seems to be very um, complicated um, as time goes on. Um, would you agree that 
green and gold open access are so complicated that another way should be thought, uh, sought to actually make um, scientific con uh, content uh, available to everybody? Because it seems to me that green and gold are so complicated that it's going to disappear under its own weight of administration. Toby, before you give up the microphone, do you want to suggest any, any other methods? That... I, I, I think you probably know the answer to that. Um, but for those of you who don't know, um, uh, we at the OECD use an, another um, form of open access called freemium open access, and it is uh, uh, administration free. Um, the problem with a third way is that you end up then with three ways and then you have another way that's meant to be the definitive alternative and then you have four alternatives and, and so on and so forth. It, it just, the, the, the best solution never kind of replaces those that are substandard. Uh, it just adds another layer of complexity, unfortunately. So I think we need to perhaps work within what we've got. That would be my own view on it. I don't know whether Yvonne would agree. <laughs> Um, I, certainly thinking um, on, on that, I, and as I said, I've been involved in open access for, for a decade now, kind of managing and dealing with these things. I think sometimes um, we are guilty of looking at the complexity. Um, as, 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 I, as I was showing, for, tried to show through my examples um, this afternoon, there are some where the complexity, there are some publications for which the complexity is very low. Um, there are some uh, ways that we are working with um, particular publishers. Um, the Springer Compact uh, comes to mind, the, um, the Wiley Open Access Dashboard. Again, very simple, straightforward processes, but for every one of those we, we have, we do have those um, uh, other examples where the whole system seems to designed to tie ourselves in knots. So whether we need to throw everything out and find a completely different approach, again, if there was another approach that um, our researchers were willing to engage with as well as they're engaging with current traditional publishing, I, I don't think anyone would object. But um, as I say, it's perhaps at the, uh, it's still a little early for that, to g or to give up on the, what we're doing at the moment. Perhaps I could say something about um, UCL Press. I talked about our institutional press in the uh, Open Science uh, presentation. So I, t I talk mainly about research monographs and um, a little bit about uh, uh, textbooks. And those are certainly the areas that I chose to start with when I was trying to reinvent uh, what the publishing model in an institutional open access publisher should look like. We are now... Um, in the middle of launching our new mega journal uh, platform, which we think is a new um, uh, format for research intensive universities to adopt when they're setting up their institutional publishing activities to offer an alternative, easier uh, platform for publishing what we might uh, today call journal articles or conference. Uh, proceedings, but we, it's not a journal in the conventional sense, although we call it uh, a mega journal. It's just a completely new platform and a new concept of how uh, academics can work together across disciplinary boundaries to uh, communicate and disseminate their, their research. We'll be starting our first mega journal platform, uh, which will be launched in the autumn, is in the field of environmental studies. Uh, and we're bringing in uh, medics, historians, uh, social scientists, geographers, uh, scientists. It is a truly interdisciplinary and cross-disciplinary approach to see whether this is a new model for disseminating research outputs in an institutional open access press to mirror the work we're already doing on textbooks and um, research monographs. So our, uh, the UCL press, uh, or the UCL view is, um, to think of new models and to test those out in the community to see whether these are viable uh, complementary alternatives to the, the commercial uh, publishing model that we already have. Okay, thank you. Um, we're just about out of time, and before any other publishers rush the stage to advertise their new journals, um, i better draw things to a close and move us on to the next thing. But before I do, uh, can we just uh, join together and thank the uh, speakers?
Okay, so the next things that are coming up uh, is the, the next meeting of the workshop. So in a moment, I'm going to ask you to rush off to your workshops. Um, <clears throat> the next two official things on the program after that are the 5.30 drinks reception and then 9.30 tomorrow morning when we start again for day two. So make a note of those two dates. This is also a good moment, um, perhaps during your workshops even, I'm going to say, to fill in your yellow survey sheets, which I'm sure you've been filling in assiduously. And some of you will have already spotted the, uh, the uh, deliberate mistake on page one, but those of you who haven't, you've got to be more diligent about your surveys because it's for a good cause. Um, so uh, the only other housekeeping thing really is a couple of people have asked me about workshops and um, can they extend the time of their workshop in some way. And you're more than welcome to extend the time of your workshop session, but I will be at the drinks reception from 5.30 sharp. I don't know about the rest of you. So to your workshops, thank you very much.